coming out today uh, for our uh, third Not Without Me forum. I'm Lanisha Cassell, the executive director here at the museum, and uh, we really appreciate your engagement. We know that if you're here that you are concerned about our community, and we appreciate that, um, the effort that you're putting forth to make a difference. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, with uh, our moderator, Rachel Rockwell, is here to uh, moderate the, the session today. So I want to introduce Rachel Rockwell, who's representing Hoover Elementary School and the Greater Cedar Rapids Community Foundation. Thanks, Rachel. What a great looking crowd. Thank you for coming out on a Sunday afternoon. I like to sit back and kind of observe and um, what I really enjoyed observing before we got started today is that there are a group of people who are happy to come out and um, come together and there's a lot of laughter and people meeting people that they haven't met before having conversations that they've been maybe wanting to have but not not had the opportunity to and we're coming together to talk about uh, you know, something that's a little bit tough, right? Something that we we don't all have answers to, and um, but look at who is in the room, and look at all of the representation from different walks of life, different organizations, and um, so that just really is a great way to start this today is with the laughter, the conversations, and then people taking their time to come out and. Um, have a conversation about what it might look like to change things for our children, change the future of Cedar Rapids. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, as Lanisha said, my name is Rachel Rockwell and I am from Cedar Rapids. I was born here and grew up here. I went to Arthur Elementary, I went to Franklin, I went to Washington High School for a little while, I went to Metro High School, I graduated from Kirkwood and later moved to Des Moines, spent some years living in Tanzania, and I'm back in my hometown now. And so um, I'm glad to be here, and I have um, a child who goes to Washington, and I have grandchildren who will be coming into the Cedar Rapids Community School District. So I really care about their success in life, and I care about the success of all of the students in the Cedar Rapids Community School District. Um, I came back in August from Tanzania and took on the role of community school coordinator at Hoover Elementary School. And I learned a lot because I didn't know what a community school was or what a community school coordinator was to do. But the idea behind the community school is that we partner with community partners, which might be nonprofit organizations, might be government, um, it might be um, businesses, we partner with the parents and the grandparents and people in the neighborhood of the schools and we really look at what are the issues, what are the needs of that community surrounding that school, what are the needs of the students in that school and what are the needs of the, the parents and addressing those so that the kids can perform so they can learn, so they can come to school ready to learn and they're able to get through the school day and learn. And looking at the teachers and staff and what their needs are also. And so when uh, Nancy Humbles came to me and said, we need to do something, I said, of course, whatever, however I can help. And so the Not Without Me um, forum was supposed to start as just one forum. And it, the committee started with just a couple of people. And now the committee meets uh, pretty much every week, and it's become a series of forums. And we've been working towards looking at what are the end results of, of all of the time that these people are putting in to planning for these forums, to all of your time when you're coming in and spending to, to figure out what's going on, what are they doing here, what are they talking about. We need some end results. We definitely want to leave with action items after every forum, but after these series of forums are done, what change have we seen? So what change have we seen in parental involvement in the schools, and what change have we seen in community involvement in the schools that is positively affecting the performance of our kids and positively affecting the future for Cedar Rapids? So this is what we want to see. We don't want to just come together and have a good time and laugh and see people that 
you don't get to see in such an informal set setting all the time. We want to figure out action items that each of us can take. And it's going to be different for each of us, mm -hmm. right? We have different amounts of time. We have different um, expertise. We have different interests. But each of us can do something to move this forward. So today, um, this is the third forum, as Lanisha said. The first forum, we didn't know um, what to expect or who was going to show up. And there was a wonderful um, group of parents and grandparents, community members, um, staff members from the Cedar Rapids Community School District, and um, district em employees that came to figure out how can we make this the best possible forum with the best results possible. And from there, uh, we were asked uh, everyone to contribute and um, let us know what do you think um, the ideal is for um, parental and community involvement in the schools. What kind of things are getting in the way of parents being involved in the schools or community partners being involved in the schools? And not, not to complain or say, parents don't care or they're too busy or the kids are just bad <laughs> you know none of that we've we've placed blame and criticism and looked at all the problems for a long time we wanted to go to the next step and think like what are potential solutions right and so we brainstormed in small groups and we shared out what are solutions to this and after we talked about solutions and shared them out we talked about what are you going to do you're going to leave today, what are you going to do? And so we received a lot of information and we were recording that information. And at the end of these forums, we really want a plan for um, how can the stakeholders, the people who care about this, what actions can they do? What can we recommend? And how can we help support that, making that happen? And so the second meeting, that forum that we had, we really got the voice of the youth getting to hear from their perspective um, what needs to happen, what are the challenges with communicating with their parents, what kind of engagement would they like to see, right? Because we don't want to all show up at school and the kids aren't happy to see us there, right? <laughs> Which is the potential, but we need to look at what do they need, what kind of support do they need? So um, since our second forum, we've, the committee has, been, has grown um, exponentially and we decided we need needed to be real clear about what the vision is for this and what we believe and to be clear of what we've already heard from everyone in the room to make sure that we're not losing sight of that. Some of you have, are, have attended the other forums and have heard what was shared out in those, but I just learned today and it's pretty exciting that um, the previous forums are on YouTube, and so if this is your first time here and you want to kind of catch up and make sure that you haven't missed anything and make sure that you're being involved in moving us towards solutions and moving us towards action, those are available also. So that's pretty exciting. So I just want to share a little bit about what we came up with as a committee about who we are and why we're doing this before we start and, and um, talk to our panelists, which have been so gracious you have to just understand, many of you work in the schools um, or have been in the schools and see, see how overwhelming it can be just to get through a day, right? Um, to make sure that the kids are safe, make sure they're able to learn, make sure the teachers have everything that they need. And so for um, this wonderful group of principals and our associate superintendent to come out on a Sunday afternoon and take extra time means that they really do care okay so we need to approach this in a way that we're all in this together we're coming together as partners to figure this thing out and to work together towards a solution it's not a time to complain or um, blame right so I just want to thank you guys because I know um, you guys need rest <laughs> and you could be taking it you could, you could be taking naps right now as we all could so thank you so much for that um, so the vision for the Not Without Me um, committee, this is a draft, so it might shift a little bit, but we feel really good about this, is that we understand that future success depends on present action. So it's not about talking, it's not about complaining. Um, we all succeed when we all engage. Our vision is to effectively partner with families and community members to improve academic achievement results. So that's the bottom line. 
we know that if our kids can improve their academic achievement and they, they can graduate from high school, then the opportunities for them in their lives open up, right? If they have success when they're young and as they're growing, then they will have success as, as adults. If they're not successful in school, starting as early as kindergarten, if they're not ready for kindergarten, looking back at their, their um, proficiency in reading in third grade and going forward, they're going to have struggles and challenges that we are all going to um, deal with in one way or another. We believe that all stakeholders, which are students, families, community, business, and educators, are responsible and need to and, and needed in order to close the uh, current achievement gaps in our system. We believe we must focus on specific challenges and populations of students and families. And we believe trust between families and educators must be intentionally built and maintained. So these forums are a way for us to do those things. The full draft of our um, vision, beliefs, definition, and, and the current stakeholder needs is over here. And I just recommend that each one of you take those with you because it does gather a lot of the information that we pulled from the first and second forum where we were getting the voices of the parents. We were getting the voices of the students and other stakeholders as to what those obstacles are. So let's go ahead and I see how I'm doing with time. I talked for my whole 10 minutes, that's amazing, plus. <laughs> so I um, just want to in introduce our panelists and we have a couple of questions for them and then um, we'll in invite you guys to ask them questions also based on their responses and then at the end we'll have some kind of open um, Q&A time with them and then when um, we're wrapped up we can kind of look at what action items that you guys have identified through the conversation and through the communications that happened today, okay? So um, I want to introduce our panelists first. We have on the far end of the table, Daniel DeVore, and he is the principal at Metro High School. Welcome. Then we've got John Klein, who's the principal at Washington High School. Welcome. Jason Martinez is here, and he's the principal at McKinley Junior High. We've got Candace Lynch, who's the principal at Johnson Elementary. An extra special guest, Doreen Bush, who's our associate superintendent for the Cedar Rapids Community School District. So Noreen, you can answer the same questions that I'm asking the principals. It'll just be more from a district perspective. And um, yeah, all right. So I think I'll start, we'll start at the far end and we'll just kind of go down with these answers. And then after everyone has been able to speak, then um, we'll open it up for just a couple of questions for time's sake. Um, I'll kind of help you move along so that we don't get stuck on just one question and then it's time to go, okay? So the first question that we have is, what is your vision for community and parental involvement and engagement at your building? And what are kind of your priorities around, around that? So at Metro High School, we're kind of a, an interesting situation and always in transition. Um, this year alone, we brought in 200 students in a school that's around 350, so the turnover is, is great. Um, that means that our focus is more about the community interaction because the, the parent groups are, are constantly shifting. Um, so some of the people that come back and help and support um, are because their kids went to Metro or they should really appreciate Metro for a variety of reasons. Uh, so one thing we want to grow is just getting more community members in the door consistently. Um, and we've had a lot of, we have a group that meets every other week to talk about better ways to do it. To be honest, this year we didn't make as much traction as we wanted to. So unfortunately, I don't have great answers for, for these questions as far as this is the path and exactly how we think it's going to look. Um, we do have a couple members of the community that currently volunteer. Um, Linda Topinka comes in and, and runs a girls group with our counselor during lunch. Our lunch time is really a great opportunity for some of this because the whole building is on lunch at the same time, so students are just kind of around. 
um, eating wherever, grabbing your lunch and going, things like that. So as many people as we can bring in, or as often as people can come in, um, whether it's consistently or once in a while, just to just to learn more about Metro 2. So I think there's sometimes a stigma out in the community about what that means, uh, what Metro is, and um, sometimes the negative things. But really, there's a lot of impressive work going on there as far as staff building relationships with students and trying to help them in all ways. And so like, our STEAM program does probably the best job of any securing volunteers. Um, and one of the ways that helps is kids start to see other opportunities in the community for them when they're done. Um, I think a lot of our, our graduates do stay in the community. And so this gives them opportunities and, and faces that they can start to connect with immediately so that when they, they take that next step, there's, they know there's people out there kind of fighting for them and that can help answer their questions. So the more exposure they can get to them. Thank you. John? All right, Rachel, how much time do I have? <laughs> Four and a half minutes. All right. <laughs> uh, so two, two big things. Number one, uh, communication and positive messages. Um, so uh, I'd be a fool to say that biases haven't existed, uh, that they don't exist, and that don't continue to exist unless we change the narrative in our community. Um, I can tell you that uh, I personally, and I know that a lot of my um, students and parents are, are, are tired of some of the, the negative messages that are out there. Um, our kids deserve better, and we have to be part of that solution. Uh, for example, Washington High School, some of you may or may not know that recently uh, we were for the vocal jazz state champs, jazz band state runners up. Uh, we've increased our academic expectations. At the same time, our students have increased their passing rates in their classes, developed an extensive RTI program, that's response to intervention program, with comprehensive supports for students to get their academic needs met, uh, an extensive mental health uh, support program, uh, recently, some of our student writers were named tops in Iowa. Um, our athletic teams are competing uh, at the state level against schools that are uh, twice our size and larger. Um, we have expanded options for our students. So, uh, for example, we have a new business program. First year of Future Business Leaders of America, we're sending students to nationals. We've expanded and uh, added our engineering uh, classes, uh, advanced manufacturing classes, robotics classes. In our culinary program, our, our program, our students finished second in the state of Iowa uh, last year. So let's let's help communicate our awesomeness, um, and I say that for for all of our schools in Cedar Rapids. Uh, and if that's not your style, when you hear folks that are speaking negatively, I would just ask that you ask questions. Are you aware of? Why might you think that way? Um, so we can. I believe that we can, and we will be a, a model. Um, of success for all students in Iowa and in the United States. So I ask that all of you are here to be positive uh, communicators. Um, also, I ask uh, other thing, recruit other parents, recruiting other parents to be involved in volunteering. Okay, so those would be two biggies. Um, now I'd just like to drill down into some areas, some specific areas where there are roles where you could be involved and we can uh, recruit others to be involved. One, academic support. Uh, so uh, working, on, uh, working on helping us develop a mentoring program for our students, uh, to hold students accountable for their grades and their attendance, to check in with students, tutoring, uh, tutoring during that RTI time, uh, during lunch, tutoring um, in small group pullouts of our ELL classes. Um, our study table after school, uh, helping us organize uh, success support initiatives for our kids. So we know that sometimes kids need um, extrinsic rewards for them to get, see, hey, I, I might kind of like this to build that intrinsic motivation. So helping us develop incentive programs for students and then uh, helping us raise money to provide uh, those rewards. Uh, helping engage other parents, so parent-parent engagement. So recruiting other parents, mentoring other parents. Uh, we know that sometimes uh, parents are intimidated by high school or uh, maybe they had a, a past experience that wasn't good or perhaps they have um, a perception that high school is uh, fine without parents or that their kids don't want them in the school. Um, well, their kids really do want them in the school, they just don't want to admit that. Uh, so mentoring other parents into the volunteering process. Um, Helping us develop uh, English classes for our, our English language learner parents. 
um, and helping us build partnerships with local colleges. Um, helping us with uh, simple things like greeting people when they come in the building. Um, helping us uh, manage our uh, student movement, lunch monitors as, as Dan mentioned, chaperones, um, uh, providing supervision at bus stops. Uh, another area, campus improvement, and that's campus beautification, um, both uh, in terms of our our natural environment, but then also, you know, there's areas that may need some, some paint or some TLC or cleaning of our display cases. Uh, fundraising, you know, that's a shocker. Uh, but the software that we are using to uh, schedule, organize, and deliver our, our response to intervention, that's our support programs for students, it costs money. Um, we've bought it, but we need to pay for it. Uh, <laughs> other fundraising, uh, furniture, um, publications, pay for publications that go, again, get those positive messages out. Uh, volunteers to assist us with activities, uh, whether that's in our parent teacher association, booster clubs, um, music performances, athletic events, clubs. Uh, school business connections, so we would love to have business leaders coming in to uh, speak to our classes and talk to our students about what careers they need to be getting ready for, what can they do, what classes should they be taking, um, what perhaps uh, job shadows or internships should they get involved with. Um, building those bridges between our, our students and our businesses here and also informing our teachers of um, what, what kind of adjustments do they need to be making to give our kids the skills necessary to help our economy and to walk into jobs here in Cedar Rapids that are going to be waiting for them. Um, class speakers. We always welcome class speakers. Um, if there was, er, if there were areas that, um, you know, we knew that volunteers had a, had a passion about a certain topic, we built a, a, a list of speakers that are interested in talking about this, that, or the other, then our teachers could perhaps invite those speakers to come in. So those are just a few areas, and I hope I've stayed within my time limit. And if I haven't, uh, I'm sorry, Rachel. <laughs> John did his homework. <laughs> Thank you. This seems like there's way more opportunities than I'm. I'm a Washington parent, so I, I know a couple of areas where I'd like to plug in. But thank you. That was very extensive. <laughs> All right. So we have Jason next. Everything John said. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to kind of hit on two things, echoing what Dan and John shared with the audience. Number one, McKinley has this wonderful opportunity <clears throat> that next year we're transitioning to become a STEAM magnet. So we're looking for opportunities at McKinley to get our kids not only out into the community, but to get the community into our schools. <clears throat> I'm trying. So McKinley is transitioning to a magnet school next year <clears throat> and one of the things that my staff and I are focusing on is not only how do we get our kids in the community but how do we get the community in the McKinley. Especially community leaders, business leaders, educational leaders that look like our students. So that's one of the big things that um, we're trying to figure out and to provide our kids with a sense of, of purpose and the sense of <clears throat> what's required for them to be successful in today's workforce. One of the issues that we're really facing right now as a building is uh, we don't know if our kids really understand um, what's required to be successful today. And so we need people to help us help them kind of re realize uh, those requirements and fulfill their potential. The other thing that we um, <clears throat> quite honestly need a lot of support with is perception. I've been uh, <clears throat> the principal at McKinley for three years now. I've lived in Cedar Rapids for three years. And one thing that I've come to realize living in Cedar Rapids during this short time is that for whatever reason, McKinley and the southeast side face this perception in this community that to this very day I still can't quite understand. Um, <clears throat> McKinley is a wonderful, wonderful school. And the southeast side is a wonderful community lovely community 
and I, I, I just don't quite understand why this perception continues to exist, despite the fact that there are parents and, and students and teachers and community leaders that work their tails off to um, combat this perception on, on a daily basis. So I think that's the other thing that we're really looking to uh, get support from you, is how do we combat this perception and how can we work together to put an end to it? Because quite honestly, it's, it's, it's not right, it's not fair, it's not reality. Those are really tough acts to follow, but I will say to kind of echo some of what um, uh, Jason was just talking about, we're just finishing our fourth year as the first magnet school in Cedar Rapids, and that perception thing, I live in the southeast side, um, just right across 19th Street, 1925th Avenue, it's always bothered me that Johnson had this really bad perception in all of Cedar Rapids. So. Um, when I decided to apply as a principal, it was something that I, I was one of those people who always said I would never, ever, ever, and I mean <coughs> ever be a principal, but it was Johnson that spoke to me that said that's why I applied because my heart went out um, to a place that had been through a lot of leadership and a lot of teachers and I did not feel like that was right for any of our kids. Um, and so I thought if it was a good match, it's a good match and I've never looked back since. I'm in my sixth year there. Um, and something that surprises me, as a magnet school, we do a lot of visits. We have visits from uh, fellow educators. We have visits from educators um, around the state. We have had some from outside of the state. We have uh, parent visitors who are possibly interested in sending their children to Johnson. And hands down, what we hear repeatedly is, holy cow, we had no idea what goes on inside these walls. This place is amazing. And so if you never step foot in there, we invite you to come in the old time. We do have an hour after thing, so bring your ID. So <laughs> that's brand new to us. But um, the things that our kids are capable of um, is absolutely astounding to me. And I think I have a much easier task at having family involvement. I feel like our families are really, really involved at the elementary level. Um, but I do think that sometimes it's our definition of what's family involvement is the thing that has to shift. We live in a pretty informal world in 2019. So I can go to a funeral, I can go to a wedding, and you might see anything from gym shorts to formal wear, right? People, just the world is different than it was when I got into education 30 years ago. So when we have formal conference nights, our, um, the people, the numbers of percentage of families that show up might not be that high. But I also have families that say to me, well, I talk to my child's teacher every single night because they walk my child out every night. We have this ongoing conversation. We have the paid version of Seesaw, which is kind of like a school Facebook. So it's very um, safe, but so the, um, work can be posted all the time. Teachers are communicating back and forth with families all the time. And we have a really good percentage of families that have signed up for that. So I feel like sometimes we have to shift what we're asking families to do in a very, very busy world where sometimes people are working two, three jobs just to keep up. Um, another thing that spoke to me about what Dan said was the mobility rate for, we've happened to feed from a couple of um, shelters that house folks that happen to be in a situation where they're homeless for the time being. So we have um, over 200 ins and outs every year. Um, and so for these little kiddos um, and for these families, really coming to school and interacting with their teachers is not their highest priority. Housing stability is their highest priority. So our teachers, we work really hard on saying that's our job to try to reach out to them and say, how do we support you? And if they feel that they can trust us to take care of their kiddos so they can focus on finding a place to live, I feel like that's, that's the least that we can do. Um, another thing that um, I feel like we do pretty well is some of those, can be, we don't just do um, Title I nights anymore, we kind of house or host community events, so our Blues and Barbecue is generally open to the entire surrounding community. We've partnered with um, Wellington Heights Neighborhood Association, uh, First Congregational Church, sometimes St. Paul's, and we try to open to the entire community so um, that that partnership is there and if something is happening in the neighborhood they would feel very free I would hope to come up to the school and let me know what's going on um, an example of 
the kinds of things that happen with our families, I feel like, which makes me, again, say I feel like they're very, very involved and supportive of the school is um, we had a not a great thing happen a couple of weeks ago where about 15 or so of our elementary school kids were getting into some issues, making really poor decisions, going up to other people's homes. And fortunately, we had some video and a family had the the ring um, and so we could see the video every single one of the families that we called said I don't want them hanging at the school I don't want to run an impact of 15 and 20 I don't want them making those decisions and here's what we're going to do to work with you to change this and we have had no problem since so I feel like um, having been there a while now the trust goes both ways um, hopefully not for all of our families but I think we work really really hard on that and I just want to applaud um, our neighborhood and community for coming together as much as they do and kind of putting a protective bubble around Johnson. I don't see a lot of issues there, but I think it is, a, um, for, for the most part, a safe place. And when things do happen, as they do anywhere, everybody kind of pulls together to support that. So. So, uh, big picture, right? Well, uh, Candy said it's a hard act to follow, but I'll just say we have amazing building leaders, and so thanks for all that you do to extend our community. I think the thing that I could add from a district lens, uh, last week we had our School Improvement Advisory Committee, which is a board-appointed committee, and we meet three times a year. We extend an invitation to community members to be involved with that. But uh, within that conversation that very evening, um, there were a few ahas. We extend invitation for folks to come and be a part of that committee, and it's hosted at our district building. But we thought, what if we actually did some more formative advisory committee and did a little road show last, uh, next year and got some, instead of asking folks to come to us, we need to think sometimes about going to them. So it's one thing to extend personal invitation and come to our district office or come to our, our school buildings, but when we're willing to be in community spaces and places like this, where are our community members? And as school people, we need to get beyond our own buildings and boundaries in order to um, involve our community. And I think that I've seen all of your buildings do that. And from a district lens, we want to be able to do that as well. One thing I want to uh, commend our movement as a district, Candy is absolutely right. We have folks knocking on our door saying, Cedar Rapids, we see the dial moving with you. What are you doing? So our reading FAST data, and FAST is a, um, uh, a reading assessment that we do at the elementary level. Um, it is a, um, a formative assessment that lets our kids know, it, or let us know from a screening perspective how our kids are performing. Our FAST data has much improved the past two years. Grantwood AEA, our local agency, is getting questions from other districts to say, we see what's happening in Cedar Rapids. We want to come watch. We want to see what's happening at Johnson Elementary. We want to see what's happening at Van Buren Elementary. We want to see what you're doing to get that dial to move. That invitation has not, or people reaching out to us has not always been our narrative. That is the narrative now. And we want our community to be part of those stories. Um, great, great things happening. Um, and that is due to the hard work that's happening within our classrooms. Our teachers are working so hard. So. I think having our community come in to see what we're doing, but also we need to be out in our community and see what you're doing too. Thank you. So we'll take about 10 minutes, and anyone from the audience, if you have any questions or comments based on that kind of first question, feel free to come up and grab the microphone if you don't have a voice that projects very well. I know there's someone who has a question. Okay, thank you. Do you want to come up? No, because okay. I have a voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a football fan, I'm not here. Um, I guess my question goes to uh, the principal at Washington. And I mean, and, and you say how all the things that you're supposed to be selling at which is fantastic, you know. And you know, any major big school, you want to have, just like the economy, you want to have the students up here who don't need much and have this, you may be top, you know, with the ACT school, but then you got that group down at the bottom. So, how do you get these two groups together? So you may have more of a parents involved in students who are doing well, okay? And this is why the students are doing well, because the parents are there. But then you have this batch down here who are not doing well. 
So is there any kind of way that you can get those parents who's up here to kind of, you know, get to the middle to some kind of way to get those two parents together? Because I know, you know, we, a parent being a, a, my child 28 now, but I knew my involvement that I was with him because he did well because I had my responsibility and held him accountable. So how do we get these two together? Because we're here because there is a problem. Okay, we can't say that. Okay, we, there is a problem. And we have a lot of kids who are, you know, you look at, you may have like young students now, like 20 valedictorians of this side, whatever, but we have a bunch that's not up there. And how do we get, you know, these parents of all to, like you said, you want parents to bring parents. So you have these parents up here to engage in this because, I mean, for the whole school to, to develop, we need to get these parents on the same level. How, how do you get people about doing that? So, so it, if I heard you correctly, um, you're asking how do we get parents that already are involved, invested in the lives of kids that, sure, great question. So there's there are um, there are a handful of ways that we're doing that. Um, to deal with very basic needs, and that's our, our, our warrior pantry and our warrior closet, and those are helping provide uh, clothing and food items for students that need those in, um, I, in, in confidential ways. Uh, and that's been going on some time. A new way that uh, parents have been getting involved is in our, uh, our response to intervention time, which is our success labs and helping students that are maybe, uh, maybe have some, some learning gaps uh, or may have some uh, social emotional needs. And we have parents that are coming in and volunteering during that RTI time and, and actually seeing some pretty awesome stuff, seeing kids that uh, have not had success uh, in middle school, came into ninth grade and um, did not have a good start. And finally are starting to see some success because those parents are coming in and they're able to uh, provide mentorship and also tutoring and accountability for the kids. And it's, it's going remarkably well. We'd love to see it increase. And uh, I can tell you, uh, just last week I met with a, a parent who was a, um, a, a very active member in our community who said she wants to come in and get involved. Uh, so it's, that is, uh, I would say right now, that is uh, the, the best opportunity is during that response intervention time. And again, that's where students are getting um, support academically, also uh, socially, emotionally. Um, in terms of the uh, areas where there's uh, extreme mental health support needs, we have professionals that are coming in to do that. I don't know if it's a tough job, but you know, I mean, you start now that way because I think that's the level we have to get at. Absolutely. I'm curious about the perception issue. Sure. You guys, both Mr. Martinez and Mr. Klein brought that up. Is it due to media focus on problems rather than progress, or is it a broader issue? I believe that it's both of those. But. Um, I've only been here for a year and a half, and so I would ask the question to uh, folks that have been here for a much longer time than me. I, I would agree. Yeah, it is the media. But then how do you guys get your positive information to the media so that we go, because all the things you say now, I mean, I can hear about fighting at the school or this and that, but I don't hear unless I pass your school and see the sign out on the window that you're sure. talking so that. So, you know, so how do you guys work at that with, you know, with Laura or whatever to get that information out? You know? Sure. I, I can only speak for McKinley, but I'm sure this is true for John as well. <clears throat> we just try to use social media as much as we can. Okay. Try to get our message out there. Not on the social media. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. 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 Right. But uh, good news doesn't sell newspapers. Yeah. 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 I, I guess I, I, two things. One is um, uh, our three grade kids went from Johnson, and we really like it. Mm -hmm. their experience there. Um, so they're no longer there. they're out of there now. But anyway, <laughs> we, didn't, we, didn't, we thought it was a good place. Um, but the second question has to do with something that John said, and I think it probably applies across the board. And that was fundraising. And <clears throat> one of the issues I have with that is um, at first, um, when our kids got into high school, grandkids got into high school, said, so, well, you know, can we? Uh, to do this for track or this for drama or you know, patron for the performing arts. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, every year it comes back to the same thing. Now, I know the restrictions, I mean, not, 
I, I know that funding for schools is an issue. Don't get me wrong. But it seems to me that if schools are offering programs to kids, that the schools ought to be willing, for the most part, to pay for them instead of turning them into salespeople, uh, you know, to raise money for whatever their sport or drama or whatever their activity is. Um, and I guess I really kind of resent that. Um, and I know it's, it's not a simple issue. But at the same time, it just doesn't seem quite fair what the kids do whose parents or grandparents cannot afford to do that, for example. Uh, and I really think that uh, the school board, and there are a couple of members here today, you know, they have the work cut out for them, but they only get so much money. Uh, how can we um, involve the community in the students' bottom page? about extracurricular activities um, when, oh, and by the way, can you afford over, you know, 50 bucks or whatever to help support the program? I guess it just doesn't seem to me to be very realistic. I would just urge um, all of you and especially the board and other administrators here to think about that. Uh, and it may mean hard decisions. It might mean that the district doesn't offer some things in favor of the programs like at Johnson and now next year at McKinley and so on. You know, maybe we got to cut some. I don't know. But I just kind of strikes a negative chord with me and uh, you know, welfare taxes <laughs> to help support the schools. And uh, we understand you got to pay for some things. But I just wonder the fundraising piece really seems to, for some reason or other, it just seems to come up every year season for something or other. Um, our grandkids now no longer call us for that because they know how I feel. <laughs> so um, I just want to bring that up. Well, I appreciate that. And I will say that uh, financial need is never a barrier to, to participation in athletics or activities for us. And um, I would say that our, our staff are sensitive to the needs of those that, that can't uh, maybe we're not asking folks that, that aren't able to to go out and, and contribute money. In fact, I, I would say I, on a personal level, agree with you. My wife's sitting over there when we have um, fundraisers. Um, we don't, we just provide money. We don't, people are going out, right. uh, beating on doors and begging people for money. Um, but I will say there are needs that, that we have at school that uh, the funds aren't there for. And so we do need to find ways to uh, provide uh, quality desks you know, for our kids to, to sit in when maybe there's some time before we're able to, uh, to get new desks or, or, uh, or, or school supplies or <laughs> so um, you know making our making our entrance uh, more beautiful with, with flowers that, that costs money so those those things so I, I appreciate your concern but I do also want to let you know that we are sensitive to that and uh, there there is, is, is not a student that is uh, not able to participate uh, in activities uh, or athletics if, if there's a, a financial need. So. Okay, did you have something to share? I just wanted to jump back one question to address the, the question of how we're telling our stories, our positive stories, and, and specifically regarding the media. Um, I think, Jason, it was you who sort of whispered towards the end essentially positive stories don't make good news. Um, so we work really hard to take advantage of social media in, in some ways because that's the platform which we can control the most in terms of the stories that are going out. Um, as communications director, I also send out press releases to the media. Sometimes they're very formal press releases, sometimes they're informal um, tips on what's going on in the schools that are positive. I send anywhere from five to eight of those emails out per week to give you a sense of how frequently I'm trying to push out um, the positive information to the media outlets regarding what's happening in our schools. But as we know, um, the positive news isn't necessarily what makes headlines and, and what builds readership. It's not criticism, it's just journalism. And so um, understanding that that's the truth about traditional media, knowing that regardless of how many positive news stories that we push out to the media, um, most frequently what I receive are inquiries about those negative stories and that's what essentially gets the, the seat and the traction. 
um, again, not a criticism, it's just the fact of the matter. And so then we have to counter that with other tools that are uh, within our power and which we can control. And so that's why we look to something like social media, which I understand that not everyone is engaged with, um, but we also uh, are working on developing a more robust and frequent newsletter that would go out to anybody internally or externally um, who would subscribe to this newsletter. We started that last year. Um, Des Moines Public School sends one out every Friday. That's what we would hope to eventually uh, get to, but still building capacity in that regard. So there are a variety of strategies that we're trying, and there's room for improvement every day. Thank you. We'll take one more question. I see Kelly, you've been raising your hand. Yes, Kelly Finn. Uh, this idea of fundraising, uh, particularly at Washington and McKinley, I've been involved in that in my little way. My business is college prep, ACT prep. And so when Carlos Grant was at Washington, I went to a community group and got a scholarship for a young man at Washington. And he joined one of my classes. He's now attending Mount Mercy University for free, free tuition. So a lot more could be done, I believe, in that way of using volunteers to approach business leaders and community groups. The money is out there. It's just somebody's got to go and ask for it, right? And so I think a lot more can be done with volunteers in that area. I'm an alumni of Washington High School, very interested in that, and that's why I went to Washington for the scholarship. But I just think, wow, there's a lot more that could be done there for kids in terms of college prep. Thank you. Yes, and that kind of comes back to that community partners, that community involvement. Everyone that lives in Cedar Rapids and Lynn County should be invested in the success of these students because that means you know, who's going to work for your company in 10 years? Um, who's going to want to move to this community in 10 years if, if we're not um, addressing these issues now, right? So um, understanding that there's partners that we haven't talked to yet and um, maybe that's a, a great volunteer opportunity within all of these schools to connect with those businesses and say, and please make that case, right? Yeah, so thank you for that. It, okay, I'm gonna, I saw your hand and your hand, right? And so we won't be able to get to the rest of questions if I take any more, but if, if you guys feel like you just have to, need to say something and it's important, please do. Sure, thank you. This is great there's a high number of ex expulsions and suspensions among black children. I wonder how it's going to be addressed. And then, uh, uh, Washington, uh, John Klein. Yep. Yep. Okay, so the yeah, yeah. question is how, how are we addressing uh, suspension rates uh, and disproportionality in, in suspensions? And so I think that when we're looking at suspensions, uh, we have to look at what are, what are the causes of the behaviors that are leading to the suspensions, right? That's, that's one piece of it. And so when we look at uh, academic engagement and making sure that we're meeting kids' needs, uh, all kids' needs, so that they have hope and that they are engaged in school, they're going to be less likely to um, participate in behaviors that are going to perhaps lead down the road of suspension. Now, once the behavior has happened, uh, one of the things that we're looking at and working on is trying to provide different alternatives to suspension. So for example, uh, community service options for kids. Uh, if kids are suspended, provide an option of, uh, would you prefer to take the days out of school or the hours of community service? And my experience has been most parents then are gonna take that community service option. But I would say, go back to what we've got to do a better job of, and I would say, uh, systemically is looking at what, what are the causes that children are making those choices to participate in the behaviors. Um, and uh, frequently it is because either um, there are needs not being met, whether they are uh, socially, emotionally, psychologically, or academically, and trying to address those needs so that we're not resorting to those behaviors. Because if our kids are engaged in school and uh, having a positive experience, it's less likely that those behaviors are going to, uh, to, to show up. We're not going to be perfect. It's going to happen at times. But being able to uh, prevent those, I think, is, is, is the best thing that we can do. And, and that's what we're focused on. 
Thank you. Um, just uh, some observations or comments that I'd like to, to express. Um, I'm troubled by the fact that summer school has become obsolete. I ask about summer school every single year, and I get the same crap. And I won't even go through the, the uh, feedback that I get on that. Uh, I moved to the Cedar Rapids from Chicago in 1987. And I moved, specifically moved to Cedar Rapids because of the school district. And it was excellent. I was so impressed when I came here in June of 1987. And my children went to Oakville School in Chicago. And I said to myself, oh my goodness, why am I paying thousands of dollars a year for education in Chicago? And I can get free in Cedar Rapids. And each school year, you know, at that time I didn't realize how, how big of an issue it was, but I discovered that I didn't see many people, and I volunteered for maybe three or four years, and Cindy Monroe said to me, you're putting in 21 hours a week just to volunteer. Have you ever thought about getting paid for it? I really never thought about that. <laughs> and I landed the best position as a pair at McKinley Middle School. And I served students for 23 years. Um, and like I said, I moved to Cedar Rapids in 1987 because of the educational system. It was excellent. Each year, my children would always have the same either comment or concern. Mom, you make them have a teacher this year. And they said that with enthusiasm. Now in here we see 32 years later, now my grandchildren attend Cedar Rapids Public Schools, and those are their same concerns. People of color make a difference in the classroom. I'll give you a prime example really quick. About three weeks ago, there was an incident between a young lady who happened to be African American, and I know that the adult, one of the adults was a counselor, and I can't read, she was female. Can't remember, or did not know the other gentleman. I didn't know what position he, uh, his role was with this particular school. She was a leader, yelling, screaming, screaming. And so they tried to de-escalate the situation, and it, it wasn't working. I get out of my car, never seen this girl in my life, and I said, I, I didn't say anything, my gesture was, <laughs> she walked over to my car, and within seconds, I was able to quiet her down, point her, and her to apologize. And I remember one of the things that I said to her, while you're yelling and screaming, no one is hearing you. And no one is going to pay attention to you. What if I were yelling when I called you over to my car, I was yelling and screaming at you and scaring you? What kind of reaction would, would, be, would I have gotten from you? Not very positive. And so the gentleman and the female counselor came over and they said, I made a difference. I, and, and, and it just so happens my grandson was there. And when we get in the car, he says to me, Grandma, what did you say to that girl to quiet her down? He said, you did that within seconds. The next day, I pulled up to the school. True story. I had about three or four students come over to my car and say, you please be our teacher? <laughs> so people of color make a difference. I made a difference at McKinley. I made a difference not only with the African American students. They thought I could solve all the world problems. <laughs> and I said I'm just one person, but I was able to relate to all students. I was also secretary of PTA. And because me being a woman of color, I was able to at that particular time, I attended Mount Zion Baptist Church. And 
I would say every week we meet, and I, it's only me. Come on, gosh, you gotta help me out. You gotta be there. You know, you can't be. It's, it's like you have a meeting at church on a Friday, and we make decisions, and then some uh, members come to church on Sunday, and they're angry because decisions were made when you were not there. So you can't represent Mount Zion on the sideline. If you're having issues with your students, with your children, you, you've got to show up. You've got to express your concern. So we started seeing more and more volunteers back in 19, I think it was 93, 94, 95, 96. We started seeing more African Americans join the PK. So African Americans in the classroom, they, they do make a difference. Okay, we can all go home now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. I, it's just a very eloquent way of summarizing why we're here. Um, bringing up some of those obstacles. Um, that we know are there, some of those things that are hard to, to bring up. And you also brought up some of those, some solutions, right? Um, so, so thank you for that. It was a great segue into kind of our next question for um, the panel here. Is, and that question, there is a, is a two part question, is you know, what we're talking about here today is parental and community engagement in the schools, right? That will help to close that achievement gap. And so one of the things that you brought up is having people of color, having students see people that look like them um, in the building is, is one um, opportunity that I know the district is looking at how they can do that, right? But they can't do it on their own. They need everyone engaged, right? They need um, us to think about, well, what role could I play in the school? Is it a volunteer? Is it a para? Is it a teacher? Is it a counselor? And, and starting to grow our own also, right? Like, so talking to our students about, you would be a great counselor in the school. You would be a great teacher. I see these skills in you. So we have to start there, because um, we can't just recruit from outside of the community. Um, so the next question that we um, have is, what obstacles, from your point of view, and from your kind of school's point of view, do you see to um, that community and parental engagement? So it could be anything, and it might be different for each school building. Um, it, and some of the things that we've identified from community members and students um, already in the previous forums, but this is, a, this is a different perspective. This is the principal's perspective that we're looking for, is you know, there's, there's a need for ongoing and consistent communication and also looking at alternatives for communication, depending on um, what the age group is or the backgrounds. So our immigrant and refugee uh, uh, population might not use Facebook. They might use WhatsApp. Um, some of us are, you know, have to discipline ourselves and say, I'm not on Facebook anymore. I'm, you know, that's, it's, it's taken over my life. I'm not doing that anymore. So what kind of ways can we communicate that? with them and different groups need more consistent reminders and ongoing communication than maybe what we're comfortable with. Um, also it's about families, community members feeling welcomed in the school, right? If volunteers show up and um, they're not welcomed immediately or if they can't find a place to park or if nobody knows what they're doing there and, and it's a frustrating um, experience the first time then they're probably not going to continue to volunteer. Um, if the volunteer coordinator at the school is too overwhelmed to even contact the parents that have signed up at the beginning of the year and saying, I would like to volunteer, and they have the stack of forms, but they never have time to, to follow up with them and follow up regularly, then we're losing opportunities. But we know that that's different in, in every school. Um, but we do know that sometimes transportation, caring for more than one child, working in schedules, when people are meeting. There's a lot of obstacles that, that get in the way. What we want to do is think about 
um, how we can um, have solutions towards those obstacles. So from the, the school principal's perspective, what things get in, in the way of parental and community engagement from in your building, and um, what opportunities do you see towards kind of solving some of those? Um, first, Ms. Barber, I'd like to mention that we recently, <laughs> we haven't actually met, but we recently did a home run with a hire, and it's your daughter who's doing the exact same work as this guy in our library. And, and it is refreshing to see her work in a way that seems uh, coaches. Uh, she's a secretary, but she does that work every day. A student comes walking through her library screaming, and she's going to get the, get over here, what are you doing? Right? What's going on? What do you need? Um, and having those conversations and building that trust. So I think, specifically to your question, the, um, <coughs> the time the volunteers have, um, so some of our students, their parents are working two three jobs, they don't have transportation to even get to those jobs sometimes, or get to us. Uh, we had a, I had to have a parent meeting where the parent had to take a cab to school um, in order to, to have that meeting. And they didn't say anything to me about that ahead of time, so we didn't know to, to go pick them up. Um, so when it comes to volunteering, then that, that makes it that much more difficult. So that time is a, is a big element. I think trust is huge. Um, you know, Ms. Barber, as you're describing, why, are, why don't we have more employees of color in our schools? We have four uh, at Metro. And to be honest, as we're going through applications, there's not always a ton of applicants. And, and I think that shows the trust or lack of trust um, within the community for, for our building. Um, the, so the trust that they can show up and that we're going to help them use their counts, right, and use their time uh, effectively, I think there's a lack of that. And I think the opportunities, I think you've highlighted them, as John read through a bunch of his, um, and you described like, wow, I didn't, okay, I can do all that, right? Um, we're not communicating with us very well, or at Metro, we're not. Um, so the people that do end up helping have a connection with somebody or a conversation starts and then they're in there the next week. But one thing I do want to mention also is, is if any of you are thinking of volunteering, one thing I can promise is that the first time is probably going to be really frustrating. The first couple of times are probably going to be really frustrating. And part of that is because in that same level, our students at Metro, they don't trust. Um, we're really dealing with disenfranchised youth who don't trust the system or the community much at all. Um, and so you're going to have to put in the time. And that's the system in the library, for instance, really put in the time to say, you can yell at me today, I'll be here tomorrow, and we can talk then. Um, and so that time will build the trust uh, and, and really allow for, for that work to be meaningful. Thank you. I asked her if you may want to come in every now and then. And, yes, and help you don't. Talk about <laughs> John, what about um, the biggest obstacles you see from your sure. building's point, and what are you trying to do to work around that? So, um, some of the barriers that, that, that we've identified or potential barriers are. Um, Parents may be not knowing staff members, not feeling welcome in the school, because um, they just don't, they don't know folks in the school. Um, not having a, a, ded a dedicated point of contact for volunteering. So who do I reach out to if I'm interested in volunteering? Um, like Dan mentioned, I hit on earlier, uh, not knowing all the different opportunities um, and roles, tasks that need to be completed. Um, opportunities for folks that have different different skill sets or different personalities. There are different volunteering opportunities that may work for one person and not for another and vice versa. Um, we, we currently don't have an annual calendar <coughs> of opportunities for volunteering. So that's one of the things that we're thinking about is how do we make a, a calendar with all of these different opportunities so that uh, people can sign up well in advance. Um, and, and, and commit to something. Um, space, space is an issue. Um, to be quite frank, space for, if we have volunteers that come in, to tutor small groups of kids. Um, having spaces for them to work with kids. Um, another major barrier is identifying, um, identifying how volunteers can help. Uh, 
this in specific subject areas. That takes time uh, from our teachers' uh, days um, to think about how can I uh, use a volunteer to help with maybe these reading skills with these kids. So defining the actual roles and then um, helping build the plans for the volunteer to be able to execute the plans in a way that's going to meet the learner's needs. That takes that takes time um, from our teachers. Our, our teachers are, are, are pressed. Um, uh, we also think a, a, a barrier is we don't have a, a platform or space for volunteers to be able to communicate really with one another. Um, so looking at a potential space in our building, uh, electronic platforms for volunteers to be able to, to collaborate with one another. Um, so a lot of it comes down to just uh, defining what what defining what can um, what what can be done or what needs to be done, um, and then being able to, to communicate that and then be able to support our volunteers um, when they when they step into those roles. Thank you. So I actually wanted to go back um, <clears throat> to two previous questions earlier. Young lady in the blue was talking earlier about um, parental involvement. How do we bring those two ends of the spectrum together? <clears throat> and I was looking around the crowd, and I was asking myself, I wonder how many people are actually here this afternoon from those two ends of the spectrum. This is a great opportunity for that, right? That's why I'm actually they need to be here. So not so much judging them, but to hear what their problems are so that we could combine and work it together. Right. And the young lady back here was talking about diverse workforce, basically. One of the things I take great pride in leading McKinley is the fact that I feel like my building is one of the most diverse in the district. I have two engagement specialists, three administrative assistants, seven paraeducators, a Hispanic principal, but only one teacher who is diverse. So it is an issue that we try to address, but the question still goes back to why aren't diverse people applying? Right. So the obstacles that we're facing primarily at McKinley, um, I think there's three. <clears throat> when it comes to parental engagement, I'm going to focus on parental engagement. Number one is probably com communication. Um, <clears throat> we do a wonderful job communicating out through social media, but we have a lot of families who don't have access. So we're not reaching those families. We know we're not reaching those families. We have to do a better job. So they're not aware of what's going on in the building. We have a lot of families who go to McKinley who are dealing with housing issues, food, clothing, health care, daycare. We have, like um, Candace mentioned earlier, over 200 students at McKinley who are coming or, coming or going on a daily basis. It's hard to get any traction when you got that many kids coming and going. Transportation is an issue. If you can get to the school, great. If you can't get to the school, then it becomes a safety issue. Some of our families and, and some of the kids are, quite frankly, um, walking to McKinley may not always be uh, the safest, uh, safest thing to do. <clears throat> I've heard that numerous times. I can't get up to the school and I'm not gonna walk. I'm not gonna walk up to McKinley at six o'clock in the evening to go watch the ball game. Forget that. And then, of course, I'm going to come back to perception once again. Um, you know, again, there's that perception for whatever reason. And I do want to, I do want to mention that Aqui and her team do a wonderful job. They do a fantastic job of helping us at McKinley, and I'm sure the other schools fight fight that perception on a daily basis. We're very appreciative of the work that they do. But <clears throat> you know, what we put out via Twitter, Facebook, or other um, means of communication through the school, sometimes. Uh, it's not enough when you're going up against major newspapers and news channels. So, but we are very appreciative of, of the support that Ockley and her team provides provides our school. I think I'm okay without that. Um, I would say, um, other than what these gentlemen have mentioned, I sometimes feel like our biggest barrier is us within the walls of the school because we just haven't thought of it yet. 
so I feel like I have heard uh, PTA members say, gosh, we just don't get enough, uh, we just don't get enough volunteerism here. And I'm like, well, I disagree because after our harvest hoopla or after we have all kinds of families stick around and help us clean up all the tables and chairs. They might not have signed up on the link that you sent out because again, people are working two, three jobs, but we do get people who stick around and support, how can I help, what do you need? Um, and I also go back to the formality of the ways we sometimes ask for help. Um, becomes very formal and relies on uh, reading your email or um, we don't have a way to text families. But when our <coughs> teachers do outreach, and again, at the elementary level, it's very easy because families are always there picking up their kids. And at Johnson, it's even easier because we don't have like a loop where everybody has to drive their cars through. We have a lot of walking families. So our teachers are interacting with families all the time. So we get all kinds of people who will support coming along on field trips. But it's the informality and the conversation and the invitation to please join us. We need you. Um, that has been really successful, I think, for us. Now that's not to say by any means that we're perfect. We have to go to people all the time. Um, and ask those questions, you know, we're worried about your kiddo, they tend to run away from the group, would you be willing to come with us on this because we want your child to be able to participate and it's important that they participate. And we have pretty good luck that way, um, but when we do these big group asks, we, we're not nearly as successful as when the teachers and the staff that they know and trust go to them. So again, I feel like our bi biggest uh, obstacle is us because we haven't necessarily thought of it yet. We haven't gotten there yet. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Sure. So uh, from a bigger lens to of what some of the obstacles we face as a community, um, and I think that a couple of our principals hit on this earlier, Many times parents are very willing to come to events that are community events, games or concerts that where they feel most comfortable. They may not feel most comfortable supporting an academic arena. I'm an English teacher. I could probably support math. I'm sure that I could, but I'm more comfortable in the English arena supporting math or supporting writing and reading. Um, so maybe finding out what people's strengths and preferences are, but for our community events, they many times happen in the evening and transfer transportation access, at least our city bus doesn't always run uh, past, I think it's a six o'clock um, hour. So thinking about it from a community perspective, of whether that be carpooling, other ways in which we could help organize in a more informal way, as Candy has said, um, we have, I love that, that perspective that you had earlier about how can our parents who are involved help our parents who are not involved. Sometimes it's just getting a ride um, and an invitation um, to an event. And that the first step is feeling comfortable in the environment, but then getting positive feedback with of exactly what you said. Thank you, we appreciate you, and we need you. And so what is it that we need? Sometimes it's very simple things. Sometimes it's literally putting letters in an envelope, um, but that we would have a list of approachable things to help our, our families be involved. And then the obstacle about diversifying our employment uh, is a real deal, and it's not just Cedar Rapids. Uh, but I am so proud of our board uh, for casting a vision around that and an investment in that strategic plan this year. So we are getting after it in a very serious way, but it is going to take time and we need community support to make it happen. Encouraging folks to apply um, is one avenue, but two, um, this is personal experience, I'd like to work with our state on even if folks who are not Iowans now but want to come to Iowa to be employed, the Board of Educational Examiners does not make it easy for teachers in Minneapolis and Chicago and St. Louis uh, to be certified in the state of Iowa. And I'm telling you, we have a great principal who's headed to our um, great district from, believe it or not, over the river, just East Moline not far away, but what he has to do to be certified in our state as a principal, who will be the future principal of Jefferson, is not easy. John Klein, has this been an easy process for you? It has not been an easy process, and uh, great certified administrators from other states and great certified teachers from other states, our, our state does not make it easy for people to come to Iowa, so we've got work to do there. 
So that's a great segue into our next section. It's about what what are you committed to do? Like, what do you want to do? So she, she started that. She's like, I'm going to go to the state. We're going to figure out how to make it an easier process. I wanted to, to add, and, and that's a great segue to talk about what the school district is doing. The school district, you're not giving yourself enough credit. So I'm going to give you some credit today because one of the things that they did, my company, I own a search firm. I own a professional executive search firm. And our job is to help find diverse leaders in organizations. So that's my shameless business plan. <laughs> but what we did for the school district, we, we hired the first ever diversity program recruiter. And her name's Joy Briscoe. If you guys have a pen, you can write that down. Joy Briscoe. Joy from Waterloo, African-American woman. The school district hired her, and her job, her number one job in my life, her number one job is you need to hire minority teachers in this that's community. Right. That's right. That's her charge. So. They're doing, and I want to give them credit for that. Now they've got to give her every tool that she needs, wherever she needs to travel, wherever, whatever rabbit hole she needs to dig down, wherever she needs to go, wherever she needs to promote. I, I call on the school district to give her the tools to do her job, because her job is to bring people that look like me into this district. So thank you for that, and we've got to give that school district credit. So I, who knew that? Who in this room knew that? That's good to know. So talk to some people that you know. Because she needs help, and the school district needs help. They hired her, they're paying her to do a job, so let's all help her. So I wanted to give you a plug for that. We just want to see people like me. Yes, yes. We absolutely. have a lot of Latinos in the community, and a lot of Latinos in the school system. Absolutely. And I want to see Latinos too. Absolutely, absolutely. On, the, on that note, absolutely. Our principal Jefferson High School, nice. fully bilingual Latino. His mother's from Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it sounds like there's some engagement that can happen. She got it started. You got it started. Who else has a question or a comment around? Up? Go ahead. She want the microphone. I can, I can meet you halfway. I think. You don't have a big, you can go anywhere you like. Okay. All right. So a couple of questions that I have that are um, more based on hearsay that I was hoping that you could dispel a, a couple of rumors that I've heard. Um, Metro and Washington High School. So is there a new, a new setup for what Metro is compared to what it used to be? I know a few years back we, at WASH we used to send many, many students that, that weren't a good fit for Washington over to Metro. And I have heard that this year, maybe five have gone, where it used to be more like 70 a year. Is that not accurate? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's way more than that. Um, I would, it's probably closer to 70. OK. But I would say Washington's put a lot of structures in place through the response to intervention. The students are finding success at Washington. Okay. And not, we may have fewer students entering Metro because of that this okay. particular year. Okay, thank you. And I know I've talked to John, you know, about some of this, but you hear the rumors and people think, you know, that it's changed or that we're not serving all of our students the way that we can be and keeping them in a, in a place that they're not going to be successful. So that was one question. The other question that I have is what, if, what about, and it's more, it has to do with what you were saying with, um, some of the parents that have successful students that want to help the ones that are not so, as successful. And um, what happens if they come to the school and they're, they're not turned, turned away necessarily, but if, they're, if they want to help and they've offered their help and they're, they're, they've been told that there's really nothing they can do, what's their next step? And I, and I, I don't know how to make it more. Um, a couple years ago, there were some a lot of issues at McKinley in particular, and a lot of parents that um, wanted to come and help, and they were told, uh, "Thank you, but we're, we've got it under control, and, and there's nothing that you can do." Anyone who wants to respond to it, I think um, we're not we're not looking for volunteers to be all night, right? We want people to get to know kids through some programs and possibly mentor and other things like that. Um, 
And so I think in that acute specific example there, that would be a struggle for me as a principal to go, oh, okay, like I don't necessarily, we don't have the infrastructure or the training to make sure we send you all out to help run hallways and things like that. Um, so really, I think the from our end would be, okay, so what is it, like Noreen said, what are you hoping to help bridge your strengths? What are you, what are you, what are you hoping to see make a change in our school? And how do we set you up with the right staff members to help facilitate that or give you space to, to operate um, with students or something like that? I think, you know, part of it is that, you know, I've found my way through PTA and a lot of um, other people that I know have as well, but it's, it, sometimes PTA isn't comfortable for others. It seems to be kind of an exclusive group and we try very hard to change that. So is there, um, I guess, what, what are the other outlets? Is it just coming to the administration to see how we can help? Or is it... Is there a way to <coughs> recruit and see what people's strengths are? I, I guess that's my question is, is what are our other outlets for other than PTA? Yeah. Well, it seems like you're being sensitive to say, like, okay, I want to help, but I'm not, my help is not coming. So, and I know these guys, they got so many things, it's principal, administration crap, they got, not like crap, things that they have to take care of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and a problem with students. So it seems like we need more of a volunteer, a person that will be in that system, like you said, somebody may have a volunteer system at the beginning of the school year, and then they don't have the time to do this all without real. So I think mean, even if you have, Wealthy parents who kids don't do well, they may not know how to communicate with someone from Chicago. They might say, oh, you know, their, their language. So it's almost like you need an advocate in the middle and say, hey, you know, I wish I could have, I'm still working every time they do. But it's almost like, you know, listen, this person may not speak your language, you know, and may not have your own income, but you can still communicate on the same level and find out this person that you got to talk to each other. Everybody has a story, okay? And you need to find out where that person comes from and what's going on and how can we help. And that's the thing. And I see like the school system needs some type of coordinator in the school system so that you guys, you know, always like get with the teachers. Who's having problems in school, okay? Let me work with this kid and then the, te the, the teacher can communicate with the teacher and then we can get with the parents and say, well, this kid here is acting, failing in math. Who do we have somebody to do that? Because I know I can't put it all on the school, okay? My kid could have gone to school in the shack. But I knew that when the teacher put the seed in him, I worked with him at home to make sure that tree keeps growing. And that's what we need. We need parents to get out here, and even if they don't have the help, and that's why I say my big advocate is get these colleges. I talked to my friend who's a professor at Cope. She said not just at, uh, education students, all students can volunteer and make sure like it's an internship or something to get them into these school systems that they get a credit or they get credit for that because if it gets there, we just got to force it and get it gone. And that's the whole thing. Thank you, Jane, and thank you. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out is over here on this table, there's some resources, so please grab them before you go. One of them is a list of the volunteer coordinators at each of the schools. So if there's a, a particular school that you're passionate about volunteering for, um, this is a good starting point to, to reach out to them and, and try and make that connection. I think um, the other thing, Jane, you had some really good questions. But um, to be able to communicate um, with everyone in the room or anyone in particular, if there's a particular school you uh, have a passion for, what, what do you want to do? How do you feel like you can make a difference? And then that will help kind of expedite things to say, okay, here's the person you need to talk to, or here's who we're going to um, get you linked up with so that we can move things forward, right? Stacy. Yeah, hey, first off, I appreciate Mrs. Uh, Humboldt and Mark's uh, getting put into the letter. Oh, I think everyone can hear me, is that right? Just a little louder. I do also want to address a uh, uh, few of the comments that were made um, uh, by the penalty principal and the penalty principal. The guy who said, you know, I don't understand this perception. And you two are relatively new uh, to the community. And about it a more deeply, right? The schools that you leave are situated uh, primarily in communities where we have um, higher minority populations, and in some cases, kind of often in high school, at least there are a lot of minorities that go to that high school. I think it's really 
you may not know this, but it's really hard for us to have such a wonderful gathering of leaders and parents and educators and uh, leave out the fact that there uh, exists in this community, um, whether we uh, want to admit it or not, there is a, an association with uh, students of color, families of color, um, and for performance and poverty, and so on and so We cannot have the conversation about why Haley and Oshie and Johnson have these perceptions without having the conversation about what the community believes to be true about poverty. Uh, that is a persisting problem. talking about the last few minutes is like what our what our commitment is not just from the folks on our panel but from folks inside of in here what today have you said okay I'm gonna go forward and do this right so thank you that's perfect thank you all right the question was about how does McKinley foster an environment that's inviting to volunteerism is that yes yeah so <clears throat> volunteerism and um, uh, I guess financial support, for lack of a better, better term. We're actually very fortunate at McKinley, in my opinion. Um, we have wonderful relationships with several business and industries in the Cedar Rapids area, especially uh, in the Med Quarter. We do a lot of work with um, the Artisan Sanctuary, Eastern, I Eastern Iowa Arts Academy, New Boco, Mercy Hospital, Wellington, uh, Wellington Heights Neighborhood Association, we have a wonderful PTA who has been very supportive um, <clears throat> over the last three years. We have uh, anonymous donors who contribute to the arts. McKinley has a, a rich history of the arts and uh, we are very, very well supported. So I personally feel like as a building principal that when it comes to volunteerism and financial support, resource support, um, people just giving their time, I, I feel like we're pretty we're in a really good spot, really good place. What about parents, parent engagement? Parent engagement? Um, you know, I think that goes back to when it comes to parent engagement at, at McKinley, I think we kind of been talking about that here the last couple of minutes about we have two ends of the spectrum at McKinley. <clears throat> and we have one, one end of the spectrum where parents um, are actively involved, actively engaged in the school. They're providing supports with the arts, providing supports in classrooms to teachers as needed, providing before and after school supports, um, giving their time, resources, uh, 
really contributing to our building. And then the, on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have parents who are dealing with a lot of a lot of um, a lot of issues. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we talked a little bit about transportation, housing, uh, food, daycare, work schedules. So that's one of the things about McKinley is that we kind of have both ends of the spectrum, and we appreciate both ends. We really do. We want to support both. And um, the thing that we're trying to figure out, McKinley, and if we can get it figured out, I probably wouldn't be here. I'd be on a beach writing the second edition of my book. Is how do we bring them together? I mean, that's that's the issue. How do we bring all McKinley families together? So that's one family, and we're supporting one another. So I'm, I'm hearing a couple things. I just kind of want to tie stuff together. Is that um, we're talking about parent engagement with parents who typically might have more obstacles than some on the other op, um, end of the spectrum to to be in the schools to show up and we've identified sometimes it's about feeling welcomed or knowing what their role might be um, or how they can help or maybe they have some history or experiences where they don't feel comfortable in the building or maybe there's language barriers there's a lot that gets in the way of that we've had a lot of conversations about all of those things could be transportation it could be um, their work schedules that type of thing what we want to be thinking about as a community is if we know that parental engagement is key to the success of our children, how can we shift like our systems and, and how we're operating? And one thing I've heard is that there, the capacity in some of these buildings, even, even if they have a community, uh, even if they have a um, person, a volunteer coordinator, is such that they don't maybe have the structure in place to just easily plug everyone into a volunteer opportunity, right? So what we might want to think about as a, a room is what community organizations, such as the neighborhood organizations, or Catherine McCauley, or you know, what organizations are already in the schools providing services, and it might be volunteering for those organizations, YPN, um, <laughs> volunteering for those organizations um, rather than um, expecting the schools to be able to be responsive right away and plug, plug you directly in. So we have to kind of be creative about um, what that looks like. But also, I think, as a school district and, and a, at a building level, we have to think about those basic needs and those obstacles that get in the way of those parents uh, being engaged and involved and address those things. So do we provide transportation? Do we make sure that there's a meal and child care for younger siblings? Um, do we look at a new structure for our PTA? Does it you know, shift to a PTO? And do we focus on making sure that um, if our goal is eventually that teachers look more like the student body, um, why don't we start with the PTA, right? And look at how do we recruit and engage uh, PTA members and start getting them in the building at that level. So there's a lot of different opportunities, but I think each one of us in this room and each principal and um, district people can think about one thing that they can do and they can focus on, right, to kind of start to shift that. And um, we'll be making movement and headway into the right direction. Stephanie. Stephanie Griffin, um, I just want to give a suggestion. Uh, and it goes back when I was a single mom. <laughs> about Coke is that we were a family and I'm not going to just, I'm not whistling this, we were a family and one thing, one challenge me being a single mom with three children that attend that school was I was challenged, I was asked why don't you become a part of the PTA? Some of our families sometimes don't think and have, have that encouragement to think that they can do that themselves but if you step out and ask them whether they're going to do it or not, but encourage those parents to get involved because a lot of them are not going to just say, hey, I want to be in the game. They're not going to do that. They, If you challenge them. And then the second thing was when I got involved, I was always motivated and encouraged to continue. Even when I went back to school, when I wasn't, I was told I'd never be anything. But I went back to school, but I was still encouraged to still stay a part of my children's life in school. And since then, 
when I got all into it and stuff, I remember telling Slady Thompson, one day I'm going to have your job. So that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> overall, overall, at the end of the day, I challenged the administrators, some of the PT, PTA members, to step out on those families that you see coming and pick their children up and say, hey, you know what? Why don't you come and just at least come to one meeting and see how it goes? When it comes to transportation, that we build a network that if some of us couldn't travel, we would actually kind of do a carpool, that type of deal. Yep, there was meals sometimes with some of our kids or um, the daycare or whatever. But we were a network. We became a network. And we became a family. And that's what it takes, and just someone stepping out and saying, hey, I challenge you to do this. Thank you, Sonia. I think that's really important. Yes. I want to slightly shift the focus, and, and I know there are issues within the school district, the buildings, that we, and, and the staff works very hard to try to resolve this issue. I want to go back to something Stacy said, and I think that, that we have to be careful and say, why are we expecting the school district to solve the problems of the greater community when it comes to race relations. That is a huge issue that goes beyond the school district. And it goes, it goes to business and government and all of the institutions. And we cannot expect the school district to solve that problem. Individual schools do what they can do when they have to. But the issue that Stacy brought up is one that is huge. We're not going to be solved here, and we shouldn't expect the school district to be able to solve that issue that's really a big, big, very big community issue. Not on their own. I don't think we should contribute, but no. But no. It's, not it's a community wide issue. issue. Thank you for that. You guys going to clap for that one? <laughs>
and to volunteer at every single thing. Even that my kids they are not in the school anymore. But I'm volunteer in different ways. But the way they do to me 30 years, 32 years ago was the trust that made me feel that I had in the school, that made me feel belong to the city. So that is what we need the immigrants. They feel belong to the city, to be part of the school system, to be part of the community. And this is what a lot of immigrants were not feeling or they are afraid to volunteer. So I think after this meeting, I always um, uh, told my community Latina to be part of volunteer in the school system. And I'm going to encourage more and more every single day to the families they serve. Thank you, Monica. So, I'm gonna, we've just got a few minutes left and um, I want to give Afri an opportunity to um, talk before you guys go, and I want um, an opportunity for our panelists to be able to say any final words around their personal commitment and what they would like to see happen in their schools, but I'm going to kind of go rogue, if any of you know me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to put someone on the spot, because what we, how we really want to end each of these meetings is with action items, with people moving forward and doing something differently than what they've done before, creating new partnerships, um, new energy around um, taking some um, action towards the solution, right? And so um, before we started, I had a conversation with someone and she told me about some great initiatives that have happened as a result of, I think, the first meeting. And um, I just would ask if she would please just come up and just share that for a moment because I think there's an opportunity for even when we're finished here for each of you to um, find someone else in the room that you connected with what they were saying or some of the frustrations they have or the ideas that they have and and make something happen it doesn't have to be filling out a volunteer card and putting it in for which school you you have a passion for it can be about continuing to come to these meetings it could be um, about joining a committee, joining a neighborhood association, or partnering with someone to do something that you're passionate about on your own. Or encouraging other people to volunteer because that might be the entryway into teachers in the future, paraprofessionals in the future um, that we already are saying that we need. So you knew who you were. I Thank did. you so much. I did. Right. My name is Charity Hansel. I'm going to use the microphone because my cop voice um, got a little a sinus infection to it, so I'm not very loud right now, which the kids at Kennedy will love tomorrow when I get there. Um, I am the school resource officer at Kennedy, and um, thank you for inviting me. I love being here. Um, I was able, I don't know if Lori's here from the Boys and Girls Club, but we had gotten in groups last month and talked about how we as community members can make a difference with our kids. Um, one thing that for school resource officers, we kind of lose a connection with our children. Um, during the summer because we're not in class. And Lori was talking about one of the things that you guys had talked about was um, two issues for kids getting to boys and girls clubs or uh, participating in activities to keep them out of trouble during the summer um, is older siblings are babysitting because mom and dads are working and transportation. So how can we solve that? And she was saying that we really liked had a vision of pop-up clubs where we would pop up in different neighborhoods. And I thought to myself, that's amazing. I love that idea, especially the school resource officers were looking for ways to stay engaged with our kids. Um, and I just happened to be the treasurer for our protective charity, which was not named after me. Um, but I am on the board. And, but we're part of the police association, and some of you may know some of the big projects we do are like Santa Cop, where we take 100 needy kids in the community, we get them uh, a winter clothing, and then our back to school program where we take uh, at least 100 kids and we get them their school supplies because they can't afford them. So the police department is very active um, in giving back to children in the community, and I met with Lori and I said, I really want to be a part of this. I think I can help fund some of this. Um, so fast forward. This is all in motion now. This is a thing that we're going to do. We've got Lori picked out different locations, Redmond Park, West Elkhorn Apartments, um, Mound View, different places where we're going to pop up. SORs are going to be a huge part of that. We're going to be there, not in uniform, 
because we want kids to see us um, as human beings, moms and, and dads and sisters and brothers. Um, but we'll have our, our squad cars there for them. They love to crawl in and out of those things. Um, so we're partnered with Lori and the Boys and Girls Club. We're going to be popping up this summer. We're going to be providing a meal to children. Uh, we're going to read to them and give away free books, and we're going to have an activity. Um, where that might be arts and crafts. That might be bringing in um, the firefighters, because who doesn't love a firefighter, right? Um, but we're going to have all kinds of fun activities. So from this has developed that, and we're going to have eight weeks of pop-up uh, throughout our community. Um, so kids that can't travel to do activities. And on Fridays, I'm really excited about this. We partner with HACAP. We're going to be giving these kids bags of food. Um, because I know there's a lot of kids that don't know where their next meal is coming from. So we're going to try and help that too and send food home with the kids. So thank you. Thank you. Any final words from the panel about your personal commitment to parental and community engagement in your schools? Anything you'd like to say to follow up in response to what you've heard today? Well, one, I don't appreciate you. Always having to go right after this amazing. I know, right? <laughs> it's because you're amazing also. <coughs> I think mine's real basic, just a starting point though, is John has a sweet list here of ways people can get involved in Washington High School. We need to get more organized with that at Metro so that when, when the question is asked, how do parents get involved, we have something that we can point them to. Um, I'll, I'll come help you with that. I like to make lists. For me. All right. <laughs> um, so I think uh, what our commitment would be is. Um, working to do a better job of planning projects and volunteer opportunities for folks, um, doing a better job of communicating that through various media, whether it's text, social media, phone, um, email, newsletter, or personal invites. Um, I, in getting volunteers through my career as an administrator, a teacher, and a three-sport coach, lots of times you, I send out emails People never will respond. I have to pick up the phone to say, hey, will you come over and help us out on Saturday? <laughs> Absolutely. And so working on uh, communicating through many different uh, media, uh, working on a, a space in our school for community members to come in uh, where they can collaborate and, and, and uh, share opportunities <coughs> and feel welcome. Um, I can also commit to if folks have a specific uh, skill that they can help kids with, whether that's uh, organizational skills, whether it's self-advocacy, whether it's healthy relationships, um, scheduling folks uh, according to whatever they're able to do into those sessions to, be, to, to come in and, and work with our kids. Um, and then also uh, we're committed to supporting our volunteers. So whether that's through helping uh, with training, um, and, and providing incentives and, and recognition. Uh, we want to make sure that we're recognizing our, our volunteers for the great work that they're doing. Um, and then I would like to just close with the two things that I opened with. One would be, um, what, what, are the, what are two things that, that all of us can do? Number one, uh, communicate positive messages. We have a lot of awesome stuff that's going on uh, for all of our students. And I um, appreciate what Mr. Walker said about uh, changing the narrative that, that sometimes exists out there. And all of us, when we hear folks saying certain things or uh, inferring things, uh, challenging those, or at the very least asking questions to determine why, why is it that you feel that way, or are you aware of this or that? So communicating those, those positive messages, and then two, uh, Bring people with you. Bring people with you. Thank you very much. Perfect. I, I would just simply say, first of all, thank you for letting me share uh, this afternoon. Uh, let's continue the conversation, rather it be with me or, or the McKinley staff. Um, let us know what, what we can do better, and we're going to continue asking you for your, for your support, your assistance. Let's bring more people to the table, and let's start taking some action. Perfect. Thank you. Um, something I'm very committed to doing is very similar conversations to what Stacy was talking about. Um, I was honored to be able to go to the White, uh, White Privilege Symposium at Coe College this fall. And I'm like, how do I not know this stuff? How do I not know this? Um, 
probably because I was born in Waterloo, grew up in Cedar Rapids, went to uh, Catholic schools my whole life, and here I am. And so, to me, I agree with you, Stacy. if we don't have the conversations, and it's not unusual for me to have a parent in my office say, help me know, I don't know. You're exactly right, I don't know, but help me, because I want to. Um, and I also want to continue our work for outreach and have our parents know how much we need them to be partners with us, um, no matter what's going on in their lives, that we're there to support that. So the invitations and the hard conversations and the open conversations about race are really important to me. I, um, just one last comment about that. I get really frustrated when um, our scores are published and it's always about proficiency scores. And after that white privilege symposium, it kind of um, crystallized things in my brain about why it frustrated me so much because when my kids were young, to make a year's growth and be proficient was they could have done that in their sleep. They had a lot of, I mean, their lives were decent, and they got things pretty much handed to them. It wasn't that hard. But to make a year and a half growth, year's growth, or two years growth, but then to still be told you're not proficient or to ask a family to have to sign something that says you're not quite there, mm -hmm. it really frustrates me and angers me for our kids. And I think I don't want to be a part of that system. I want to be a part of a system that supports all of our kids mm -hmm. in being the best that they can be. So. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Maureen's going to stay. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. So uh, I'm very committed to our vision as a district, which is every learner, every, every learner to be future ready. And so I am, um, I know you want me to say it, right? I was ready, I was ready to go. Every learner. Future ready. There you go. Um, I am, uh, yes, whether it be um, from the state level, whatever I can do to advocate for the children of Cedar Rapids Community School District, I'm 100% committed to that. And two, listening and listening and listening to our community and what our needs are. I think at the individual level, I need to do uh, personal invitations to be part of our community groups, like School Improvement Advisory Committee, for example. And from a district level, um, uh, we have uh, administrators who couldn't be here this weekend. Rod Dooley, Adam Zimmerman, John Rice. Tara Troster, if you know Tara, she's teacher leader, committed to our vision, Every Learner Future Ready. They're in Washington, D.C., learning uh, today and, and for several days this week um, uh, from a national lens of equity. And so uh, from a district level, um, those things that we need to do to be on the national front of best research practices about true family community engagement. So what I need to do at the district level to support that, but from a personal level, personal invitation. Perfect, thank you. Now we have Aqui here who's going to talk just a little bit about the process to volunteer at the schools through the district. But I just before I'm going to hand it over to her and then it's going to be time to go. But I just want you guys, if you have a personal commitment, share it with someone at the table. Send an email and, and tell someone, I want to do this. Or invite that parent to the next forum. Um, do it right away so that, and, and let someone else know. Uh, document it so that it will encourage you to to move forward also so that we're not meeting next month you're like oh I was gonna do this so here you go Aki. thank you thank you one of the consistent themes throughout this process so far um, has been around volunteering in the schools and I am communications director but I'm also the um, director of the volunteer program at Cedar Rapids Community School District so we have these yellow cards, which at the elementary school level right now are actually no longer being used, but for this purpose, we will use them. Um, as Candy mentioned, we're moving to a system called Raptor, which is an electronic system. It's web-based, and by the beginning of the following school year, we will have all of our schools engaged in the Raptor process, which will eliminate the need for these yellow cards. But again, we're going to use these yellow cards in this instance. So. You can consider this your golden ticket into volunteering in our schools. Um, uh, you would fill this information out. And we considered putting these cards at all of the tables uh, prior to the beginning of the meeting so that you could fill them out during the meeting. But there are three questions on this card which we did not want to alarm anyone about. Um, and we thought it would be better to just address them and, and make sure that you're aware they exist. So there are questions here regarding whether or not um, you've been convicted of a felony. There are three questions on here altogether that are essentially designed to make sure that we're ensuring the safety of our students. 
And if you answer yes to any one of those questions, it does not exclude you automatically from being able to volunteer in our schools. So I'm offering that to the group, but also to anybody else in your circles who you may know want to volunteer. We don't want that to scare anyone off. So um, you would be answering these questions, filling out your contact information, signing the card, and then this card would be handed off to any number of our volunteer or enrichment coordinators. We have one for each building. Um, just as this person was mentioning earlier, it wouldn't be nice if we had a coordinator in each building handling this. We do! Um, and so that is the person uh, with whom these cards will end up. And then they will contact you. Your information would go into a database. They would contact you regarding volunteer opportunities. But this is not the only approach that you can take. The other approach would be to go directly to the schools or directly to the principals of those schools or directly to the classroom teachers in those schools and say, hey, I have this particular interest or this area of expertise. Um, what do you need? How can I be useful to you? And then they would say, oh my goodness, I'm so thankful that you asked. Here's what I need from you. But first, we have to make sure that you've completed one of these. So there's that approach as well, OK? The third approach would be to connect with other organizations in the community who are already engaged and have very clear and direct pipelines of volunteerism into our schools, like United Way. So there are a multitude of organizations that already have, like I said, very clear direct pipelines into our schools as volunteers. You could engage with those organizations first and then volunteer in our buildings through those organizations. So ultimately, three ways that you can get involved. Um, we have a stack of these yellow cards here. You can take them with you, um, complete them on your own, and then drop them off at the school that you would like to volunteer in. Or um, you can fill it out here, and then we have baskets that we could collect them here if you'd like. And uh, we can always use more support. Thank you. Okay, and we're at our time. Just a reminder, next month in May, there will be a lot of graduations and weddings and all kinds of things, so we will not have a forum meeting in May. We'll meet again in July. You can go on Facebook and you'll see the updated schedule. June, I bet, June. <laughs> Um, there we go. It's right there behind me. So thank you all for your participation today. This is lovely. Really appreciate it.